Well, as I say, if the oceans die, we die. We don't live on this planet with a dead ocean. And the ocean is the life support system of the planet. I guess the best way to illustrate that is if you look at the Earth as a spaceship, which is what it is, or on this incredible voyage around the Milky Way galaxy, and every spaceship has a life support system that provides the the food we eat and the air we breathe and regulates climate and temperature. And uh, that support, life support system is run by and maintained by a crew of engineers, all of those species that make things work. And we humans, we're not the engineers, we're, we're passengers having a great time amusing ourselves. But what we are doing is we're killing off the engineers. And the more engineers we kill, that is everything from the bees, the trees, the worms, to the fishes, to the whales, the more that we kill, the more the, uh, the life support system begins to break down. And, uh, and if it collapses, then what we have is uh, an ecological collapse and uh, we won't be able to survive that. So let's start. Hello, Captain Paul Watson. Thanks so, Hello. Thanks so much for accepting my invitation. Oh, my pleasure. Uh, how are you? And, and where are you? I'm in Paris right now and doing well. We uh, had a successful summer of campaigns and uh, we're preparing for uh, another campaign against super trawlers. Um, so I just wanted to give you a brief introduction to give you some context and, uh, and also a question to start. So there are many different ways of, uh, looking at, at the world and each of us, you know, has an angle. And what I'm trying to do with this podcast is to understand the different worldviews and to find out what are the most relevant and what truly matters for us to be able to make better decisions, you know, about our future. So the, the classical question I start with is, how would you describe your own angle? You know, what do you think is really important to better understand uh, regarding what is going on with the world right now? Well, my approach is uh, one of uh, called biocentrism, and it's a philosophical view that you know we're part of everything. We're not lord and ma- dominant over everything else. Like for ten thousand years, human societies have been anthropocentric, except for indigenous cultures. What that means is that they believe that everything is uh, about humanity. It's all created for us, and we're the only really important species. The biocentric point of view is that we're part of everything, and everything is interdependent. And therefore, if we're going to survive, we have to live within the laws of ecology. That is the law of diversity, that the strength of an ecosystem is dependent upon diversity within it. The law of interdependence, that all species within an ecosystem are interdependent with each other. And the law of finite resources, that there's a limit to growth because there's a limit to carrying capacity. And when one species steals the carrying capacity from other species, that causes diminishment in both diversity and interdependence, which leads towards ecological collapse. And I believe that's what's happening right now is that uh, we're living in the Anthropocene, which is called also called the sixth major extinction. And that's because of the massive uh, number of species of plants and animals that are going extinct. Okay, so very clear and very systemic view, I, I guess. We're mm-hmm. part of this world and uh, something's going on with the world and trying to understand, you know, what the, I call it the, the playing field. You know, we're part of the game in there and destroying our own playing field. What are you, how would you describe that? What are you fighting for and, and why? Really fighting for the survival of uh, the oceans and therefore the survival of life since 1950, there's been a 40% diminishment of phytoplankton in the seas. And phytoplankton provides up to 70% of the oxygen in the air we breathe and sequesters enormous amounts of CO2. So if phytoplankton were to disappear from the ocean, then we die. We don't live on this planet without phytoplankton. Life is dependent upon these aquatic plants that provide the oxygen sequester CO2. And it's really the foundation of everything in the ocean. The phytoplankton is eaten by the zooplankton, which is eaten by the fish, which is eaten by the whales. And one of the reasons for this diminishment is the diminishment of other species. For instance, whales are like the farmers of the ocean. They provide the nutrient base for phytoplankton, magnesium, nitrogen, iron, and that comes from the feces of the whales. One blue whale, for example, dumps about three tons of fecal material every day, uh, heavily rich in those three uh, nutrients. And uh, when you reduce the, the whale population, you reduce the, the nutrient base for the phytoplankton. So nature's worked really well for thousands and thousands of years, uh, recycling uh, oxygen, recycling nutrients. And uh, we've interfered with that by overfishing, by pollution, and by the killing off of whales and seals and other marine mammals. And that's really the root cause of the problem. 
So basically you're fighting for a uh, survival of, uh, of the living. Well, as I say, if the oceans die, we die. We don't live on this planet with a dead ocean. And the ocean yeah. is the life support system of the planet. I guess the best way to illustrate that is if you look at the Earth as a spaceship, which is what it is, or on this incredible voyage around the Milky Way galaxy. And every spaceship has a life support system that provides the, the food we eat and the air we breathe and regulates climate and temperature. And uh, that support, life support system is run by and maintained by a crew of engineers, all of those species that make things work. And we humans, we're not the engineers, we're, we're passengers having a great time amusing ourselves. But what we are doing is we're killing off the engineers. And the more engineers we kill, that is everything from the bees, the trees, the worms, to the fishes, to the whales, the more that we kill, the more the, uh, the life support system begins to break down. And, uh, and if it collapses, then what we have is uh, an ecological collapse, and uh, we won't be able to survive that. And uh, who, who are you fighting against? I guess it's, a, it's usually a tough question because there are different levels of answer, and we tend to usually focus on the symptoms. And in your case, you know, there would be, for example, uh, a boat, you know, or, and the crew that comes with it that is chasing a well, to be very uh, practical. But what is the root cause? And who are uh, the adversaries? Well, what we're fighting really is anthropocentrism, this dominant human worldview that we control everything. We can do anything we want with anything. But, you know, any movement is like uh, an ecosystem where the strength of an ecosystem is dependent upon diversity. A movement is dependent upon a diversity of approaches. And that could be education, litigation, legislation, direct intervention, direct action, actually. And we all do our part. Uh, what I've been focusing on is the protection of marine mammals and marine life, uh, stopping whaling, stopping sealing, uh, stopping overfishing. But there are so many other things that need to be addressed and are being addressed by passionate and courageous uh, individuals around the world. And so that's really the strength of a movement is that kind of uh, diversity. People who are attacking uh, in tackling uh, climate change or diminishment of species or pollution, you know, whatever people choose to be involved in. And really, I just encourage people to use their skills and ability to the best of their ability to try and make this a better world. And individuals can really make a difference. I mean, because of Diane Fossey, we still have mountain gorillas in Rwanda. Because of David Wingate, we still have uh, storm petrels in Bermuda. And so individuals all over the world are actually making an incredible difference. And I can't think of anything more honorable than because you've lived uh, and dedicated your life to protecting an ecosystem or an endangered species and they survived. That's a lasting legacy. I think we'll get back to that question of uh, who's, who's the adversary, because it's a, it's a tough one and that can be related to the strategies. But I want to, to talk about the choices you made a while ago regarding you know, these, these tactics and these strategies. So Sea Shepherd is, um, which you found it, is, is associated to the pirate flag. I don't know what's the logo name. There is a name, but I, I can't remember it, but it's basically about direct actions kind of without asking permission, hence the pirate. Why and how, how did you get there? Well, well, the flags actually comes from the French, the Jolly Rouge, the Jolly okay. Roger. And, um, the. You know, every pirate had their own, own, own flag. And in the 90s, when people began calling us pirates for what we were doing, I said, okay, if you want to call us pirates, we'll be pirates, you know, because pirates got things done. They just cut through the bureaucracy and the red tape and they got things done. And if you look throughout history at pirates who got things done, let's take a look at John Paul Jones, the founder of the United States Navy, who was also the founder of the Russian Navy, by the way. And he was a pirate, as was um, or Sir Francis Drake or uh, Roger Surcouf or uh, uh, Sir Walter Raleigh or Jean Lafitte. They were all pirates, and they actually got things done. <laughs> and uh, so, but when you know, if you go back to the golden age of piracy, they were way, way ahead of their time. This was a time when pirates elected, democratically elected their captains, where they accepted anybody on their crew, regardless of race or gender. So way, way ahead of their time. And uh, in a time when, you know, a 10-year-old boy could be hung for stealing a loaf of bread in London, it wasn't a big stretch to become a pirate and uh, go after, uh, you know, treasures on the high seas. And when people say, oh, they are thieves, yeah, well, who did they steal the gold from? The Spaniards. And who did the best Spaniards get the gold from? They stole it from the Indians. Mm -hmm. So they weren't all that bad. But anyway, uh, the great thing about the pirate flag or the Jolly Roger is that uh, uh, children love it. Young people love it. Uh, it's a romantic sort of a symbol. 
And uh, I found that people really embrace it. And because of that, we've, uh, we've used it over the years. And uh, I want to talk about also the, go back to the, the, the why you're talking about the fact that you don't go by the rules, basically, and uh, you know, who is the pirate in the room? And, and I read somewhere that you describe yourself as a conservative and mm -hmm. when people tend to describe you as radical. And uh, I know that words and language in, in general is something powerful and that is today actually more and more distorted. Can you explain this to me and, and why do you think this matters? Well, I get called a lot of names. People call me an eco-terrorist, but I've never worked for Monsanto or Exxon, so I'm not an eco-terrorist. But, um, you know, when people say, are you a radical? My response to that is, no, I'm a, I'm a conservative. You don't get more conservative than being a conservationist. We're here to conserve. That's the root of the word conservative is to conserve. It's been changed around to support right-wing agendas or whatever, but it's still the root of the word is to conserve and to protect. And so in that, I, I look upon what we do as being a very conservative approach. But also we don't break any laws. We operate within the boundaries of practicality and within the boundaries of international law. But law is very confusing. What is legal in one country isn't legal in another. But when you're on the high seas, there's international law. And that, I think that supersedes all kinds of national laws. But really, you have to, you know, a few years ago, I, was, I gave a lecture to the FBI in the United States. I was, they actually paid me to come and give a talk to them. And one of the questions was, well, Sea Shepherd's walking a very fine line when it comes to the law. And my answer was, does it matter how fine the line is as long as you don't actually cross the line? And we don't cross that line. We've never injured anybody. I set up the strategy of aggressive nonviolence in 1977. And what that means is to aggressively intervene without causing injury to anybody. Now, people say, well, you sink whaling ships. Well, that's a piece of material. You cannot commit an act of violence against a non-sentient object. And if you destroy a piece of equipment as you, that is used illegally being used to take a life, then that is an act of nonviolence. If somebody's about to shoot an elephant, and I knock the rifle out of their hand and destroy the rifle to save the elephant. That's an act of nonviolence. So it really is uh, how, how it's interpreted. But, you know, when we live in a world where property has more value than life, then, of course, it's going to be looked at as uh, being unacceptable. So if I hear you, kind of uh, violence is, uh, is, is, is being defined as not abiding by the law in some, in some places. It could be, actually, let's tell a little bit on this, you know, violence versus nonviolence, because it's a big topic. And it's been debated and still, still is, you know, what works, what can be done. And for some, you know, like nothing changes without real physical opposition or even threat or, or fear. And for others, violence can be counterproductive. And you always have these two sides. So do you have a point of view on this? And, and what is the limit, you know, if any? Well, a few years ago, uh, back in 1985, I had two Tibetan monks came to my ship and they had a little statue of a horse-headed dragon-like demon. I, anyway, they said, can you put it up on your mass? It's good, well, good luck. And I didn't, you know, I don't really believe that, but uh, if a couple of Tibetan monks asked me to do that, oh, sure, why not? There's no harm being done. And I didn't think anything of it until 1989 when I had the occasion to have lunch with and talk with and meet with uh, the Dalai Lama. And I showed him a picture of it. And then I found out he had sent it to us. Uh, and so I said, well, what does it mean? He says, it's called Hayagriva. And I said, well, what does that mean? And he says, it's a symbol for the compassionate aspect of the wrath of the Buddha. And I said, well, what does that mean? And he said, well, you never want to hurt anybody, but sometimes when they cannot see enlightenment, scare the hell out of them until they do. So that is the <laughs> approach that we, uh, that we take. We're not going to hurt anybody. We've never hurt anybody, but we're going to aggressively deliver a message that what they're doing is unacceptable. But the bottom line for us is the saving of lives from an illegal activity. The people we oppose are criminals. I mean, they're okay. the real pirates when you really think about it. So, but they, unfortunately, these criminals have the backing of governments and corporations because let's face it, a lot of governments are pretty corrupt. <laughs> and uh, so that's what we're battling up against. For instance, I'm the only person in the history of Interpol to be put on the Interpol red notice. The Interpol Red Notice is for serial killers, war criminals, and major drug traffickers. I'm the only person on there for the charge of trespassing, trespassing on a whaling ship. Didn't hurt anybody, didn't damage any property, didn't steal anything. But that shows you the uh, political power of Japan, that they could get me on that Red Notice. 
My case is actually cited as an example of a European Commission's uh, report on the abuse of Interpol for political reasons. But, uh, you know, so I haven't done anything wrong in that respect. I opposed an illegal activity in the Southern Ocean, and we won. We drove the Japanese whaling fleet out of the Southern Ocean. We cost them hundreds of millions of dollars, and we saved 6,500 whales in the process. And that made them quite angry. So they're using their political influence uh, as a weapon against me. But, you know, that was in 2012, and I'm still free and still around. Yeah, you're not supposed to be, to be out of the U.S., correct? Well, uh, uh, the, what happened is that uh, Gen uh, Secretary of State John Kerry took a look at this and said, this is ridiculous. And so he allowed me uh, to return to the United States. And I can come to France because uh, the government of France has no problem with me. I can go to Ireland. But okay. other places are unpredictable. I know Canada, my home country, uh, you're Trudeau. I mean, Justin Trudeau is bad as his father. <laughs> Uh, he said he personally said that uh, you know I would he would send me to Japan if I enter Canada. So I haven't been able to enter my own country for for ten years now because of that. Then, but they have their own reason to be against me because of our opposition to salmon farming and the killing of seals and the killing of wolves, which are campaigns that I've led. So I've angered the Canadian government. So because of that anger, we're willing to do Japan's bidding. Now that's interesting, also because you you say it, even with the Japanese, you take the Japanese example. The things where you were doing were against people who were not respecting the law, and yet the Japanese government is pissed off. So, yeah. how, again, how do you explain that? It, that? That's very interesting to see how you know the structures of this world work because uh, it's always uh, blurry. Well, in 2014, uh, J Japanese whaling was brought before the International Court of Justice at the Hague, and the ruling of the International Court was that it was illegal. Japan responded by shutting down their operations for one year and then starting it all up again like nothing had ever <laughs> been said. So we resumed our interventions uh, against it. But uh, one of the reasons I could operate out of Australia and out of New Zealand was because uh, both Australia and New Zealand didn't recognize uh, Japan's right to kill whales in the Southern Ocean. And especially for Australia, because whales were being killed in the Australian Antarctic Territory, which Japan says, well, we don't, we don't recognize that. So there's a bit of a dispute between Australia and Japan over that. But some countries uh, just do whatever they want. China, for instance, and Spain, when it comes to overfishing, um, you know, you can't do anything about it because it gets into the Spanish courts, for example, and they just throw it out for lack of jurisdiction. But mm -hmm. uh, again, there, you know, there's Russian yeah. operations, Korean operations. They're all, they're all illegal, but they're back for their governments. Well, yeah. I mean, I mean, the ocean is, is big and difficult to, uh, anyway, this is a place where it's very difficult to, uh, apply the law, I guess. You have all these courts and all this stuff. And yeah, that, that's a, that's a good question, actually. How much is it that people just don't want to let go and don't apply the law or, and how much comes from the fact that it's, uh, actually too, too large? Well, there's a lack of economic and political motivation for governments to intervene to uphold the law. The laws are there, but what's in it for us, really? You know, how are we going to gain? If they have something to gain, yes, say if they're encroaching upon uh, the fishing grounds, for instance, which were in the 200-mile limit, yes, they're going to take action. But beyond 200 miles, the ocean is a wild west. People do whatever they want, and they get away with it. And one of the reasons we get away with it is because of that same situation. You know, if they can't arrest them, then how are they going to arrest us? You know, so yeah. it's a, it's a catch-22 for them also. But again, the pirates get things done, and uh, we go out and intervene where others don't. Toothfish poaching, which is uh, marketed as Chilean sea bass, is not from Chile, it's not a bass, but it's an endangered species, but it's being taken by um, uh, Australian and Spanish operations. And... Um, you know, nobody did anything about it up until 2015. We would report the operations from the Southern Ocean. We would report them to Australia and New Zealand, and they say, thank you very much, and did absolutely nothing. And they knew it was illegal. These ships were on the Interpol purple list, meaning that they were wanted for illegal fishing. So in 2015, we, I sent two ships after them. And uh, one of them found the uh, notorious fishing vessel, the Thunder, the worst pirate of them all. And began a chase which lasted 110 days, the longest pursuit of a poacher in maritime history. The second vessel that I sent, its job was to confiscate the line that was, uh, the gill net that was dropped by the, um, by the, the thunder. 
It took us 200 hours to pull that net from the bottom. It was 76 kilometers long and weighed 70 tons. That's how big a net this industrialized fishing net was. We confiscated that net. We turned it over to Interpol and uh, the per evidence, and then we destroyed it. it was all, then we recycled it uh, into shoes. We worked with Adidas to Adidas, recycle yeah. it into shoes. But the thunder itself was pursued for 110 days, and then uh, the, the captain sank his own ship. He sank his ship to destroy the evidence, and uh, we boarded that sinking ship, and we got the evidence, and the captain went to prison for three years, and the two officers went to prison for two years. But they, went, they didn't get go to prison for overfishing. They went to prison for sinking their ship in the waters of San Tome and Principe. And uh, so that was yeah. the reason for that. But we got them, uh, and the ship was no, never paid any insurance on it. Uh, the company, a Spanish company, was fined 17 million euros, but they never paid because the Spanish courts just said, we don't have any jurisdiction and threw it out. Yeah, well, this is where it gets uh, complicated. What, what are the, again, some of your biggest victories in, in why did it work? And on the country, when did you fail and, and, and why? Well, our, lessons big, there. our biggest victory, of course, was driving the Japanese whaling fleet out of the Southern Ocean a Whale Sanctuary. It's called a Whale Sanctuary, and they were fishing there illegally. We drove them out. They're not doing that, and they haven't done it now for a number of years. Our second big uh, victory was uh, stopping, uh, undermining the market for Canadian seal products. Uh, and I've sent numerous expeditions there. Finally, in 2008, Europe banned all Canadian seal products. Other countries like China and that did ban banning. So there is no commercial market for seal products. They're still killing seals because they're subsidized by the Canadian government to the tune of $20 million a year. But although they set the quota at 400,000, the kill is only 10% of that because there simply is no market. So that was a, a major, a major victory. We also helped to end drift net fishing in the Pacific and in the Atlantic by interventions and highly publicizing these hundred mile long drift nets. We confiscated them. We destroyed them. We got it into the international media to, to do that. And also we shut down, uh, Icelandic whale whaling in 1986. I sank half the Icelandic whaling fleet, shut them down for a number of years. When they tried to do it again, I, uh, we intervened in 2007, shut them down. We intervened in 2019. We shut them down this summer, uh, within hours of our arrival in Icelandic waters, the Icelandic government put a temporary ban on whaling, uh, yeah. until August 31st. Um, and Kristen Lofsen, who owns a whaling fleet is trying to resurrect that. He's demanding a four-year permit. And uh, if he gets it, we'll be back there in uh, June of 2024 to once again intercept his vessels. They're, oper they're killing endangered whales uh, in violation of International Whaling Commission regulation that bans uh, commercial whaling. All commercial whaling is illegal in the world today. But we've made a, here's the difference. When I, I, I said, since I started in 1974, I would say 90% of the whaling has been shut down. We're not seeing any whaling anymore from, uh, from, uh, from Australia or Chile or Peru. Uh, so all whaling has been effectively shut down in international waters and no, now only exists uh, in the territorial waters of, um, of Japan, Norway, Denmark, and Iceland. And, and your, some of your failures, you know, when did you fail and, and what were the reasons? What were the reasons? Well, I don't really look at it as a failure. What happens is that these things, like, for instance, we started killing, uh, we started going against the killing of pilot whales in the Barrow Islands in, uh, in 1983, and we're still fighting it. So I don't look at it as a failure. It's a, just an ongoing battle. We just keep the pressure on. We never surrender. We never give up. We just keep that pressure on. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that. No, look forward. This is the magic of live broadcasting. Now people know that it's actually not live. Damn it. <laughs> so yeah, new, new location, but, uh, less noisy. But the part about having to move in there and then it's live. <laughs> <laughs> so no, I was, I was about to ask you a quick question about uh, what you're doing now, because there was recently, uh, yeah, I can call it a kind of internal crisis at Sea Shepherd that lead to, led you to leaving the organization and finding a new one named Captain Paul Watson Foundation. And I, to be honest, I didn't read much about it and I'm not an insider, but from what I understand, it's uh, at least in part related to arguments regarding the strategy. And uh, I don't want to go into the details, but what are the learnings there for you and what are the insights that can be useful for those listening and the activists? 
Well, it was a hostile takeover. And I think the motivation was, is that as long as we were small, we were able to do what we were doing. And then we had the Whale Wars TV show, which brought in a lot of support and a lot of money. And therefore, a lot of people involved with Sea Shepherd suddenly found themselves with high paying jobs and they were paying themselves a lot of money. And uh, I became a bis- a, a, what they call the Watson problem. And the reason for the Watson problem was that I insisted that we continue to do what we do in the way that we were doing it. And then, and this all started in 2019 when I did the campaign to Iceland and uh, that caused a lot of problems. They saying, well, we don't want to be perceived that way anymore. You're too controversial. You're too confront- confrontational. And we, we want to take a different path. We want to go mainstream. And that man, and, and I said, no, I can't, I can't support that. That's not what we're all about. This movement is about aggressive nonviolence. That's what we do. And, uh, basically, uh, I was maneuvered off of the board of directors, uh, in the United States and, uh, that, uh, and, and then forced to forced to leave. And in fact, I was told that I either had to accept this new direction or, um, because I was, I was employed. They said, you're an employee, you do what you're told. And I said, no, no, I, I, I'm not here because it's a job. I'm here because this is a, something I've done for 45 years and tend to continue to do it. But I was still with Sea Shepherd Global, so I wasn't too concerned. But in the U.S., what they did was they covertly registered all the trademarks in 75 countries at the cost of about a half a million dollars. And uh, then they, um, they went to the global people and said, well, we own you, and we're demanding that you dismiss Paul Watson from the board. And they did, without even a discussion, without a vote. The only person who disagreed with that was Lamia Salami, who's the president of Sea Shepherd France. And because she continued to question this, they dismissed her from the board without a, a, a vote or a discussion. So it's been a very, um, uh, that was the reason for it. But as soon as I, I was out of Sea Shepherd, I said, okay, well, we're going to continue to do what we've been doing. So I set up the Captain Paul Watson Foundation. The reason I call it that was because they're going to have a hard time take, they're going to have a hard time taking that name away from, from me. So, um, <laughs> so anyway, so that's the reason we did, we did, we did that. But you still, you still have your boats or uh, how, how does it work now for no, those they, who... they, they took all the assets, they took the boats, they took everything, but, uh, I still had a support base and that support base came with me. And, uh, John Paul DeJore was a longtime friend and supporter. Uh, he said, uh, cause we had a boat, a sea shepherd and a boat named after him. And they just scrapped it without even talking to him. And, um. So he called me up and he said, just find another ship and I'll, okay. I'll sponsor it, which I did. And, uh, a lot of my crew came over with me and a lot of supporters came and contacted me and continued to support me. So we're now working on getting our second ship and, uh, we're working closely with Sea Shepherd France and Sea Shepherd Brazil. But other than that, we're a separate entity and we're now registered in Australia New Zealand, Spain, Italy, Germany, and we're growing. So I think we've come an awful long way in, in one year. I mean, it took me years and years and years to build up Sea Shepherd, but now uh, I think we can do it much faster with the foundation. And also, here's the thing. People supported what we stood for in the foundation. Mm-hmm. They do not support what they're doing with, the, with Sea Shepherd now. Because Sea Shepherd is not direct action anymore. Sea Shepherd is mainly um, working with governments, working mainstream, uh, being uh, compromised. In fact, Sea Shepherd Australia is in partnership with Austro Fishing and Marua Daichiro of Japan Fishing Corporations, which is just a, a completely against everything that we've ever stood for. And why are they doing that? Because the CEO of Austral Fisheries told Sea Shepherd Australia, I can get you a tax exempt status in Australia, which they have been trying to get for a number of years. And, uh, but if, if you partner with us and that's what they did. So basically they sold, uh, sold everything out. And they sold it out so they can keep their jobs and their job security. And that's so the approach will change at Sea Shepherd Global and the tactics will change in the overall strategy, right? It's already changed. They're not doing anything controversial. They're not doing anything that's going to really rock the boat. <laughs> and as I always said, you know, my job as a conservationist is, is to rock the boat and say things that people don't want to hear and do things people don't want to be seen done. You know, we're here to... We're here to piss people off because people are the problem. And, uh, you know, we got to get into their face and say, look, this is unacceptable. We're just not going to accept this behavior anymore. Overfishing, pollution, all of these things that are leading to, uh, the the decline of, um, of so many species worldwide. We're not going to accept it. Um, we're going to resist. And of course we, we have no choice. We have to resist nonviolently because, you know, Mm -hmm. governments have a monopoly on violence. You have to use a proper strategy in order to combat this. So I think aggressive nonviolence is the, the right strategy because 
Uh, it's not extreme enough that they'll take us out and yet it gets, it gets things done. It's annoying kind of to annoy them. Well, it's not just annoying. It's actually effective. When you shut down whaling operations, when yeah, you yeah. shut sealing operations, it is uh, effective. Um, what do you think of, of protests as tactics? And uh, I, I want to spell, to spend a little bit of, to dwell a bit on this because it's, uh, for some people, it's acceptable to work with, with, with the system, with, with governments or with, uh, uh the private sectors. And you say, no, it, it just doesn't work because you get compromised at some point. And, and so can you elaborate a little bit on this? If you have I'm examples not, and, uh, and also the, the tactic of protests. I'm not saying no, it doesn't work. I'm okay. just saying that the strength of an ecosystem is diversity. The strength of a movement is diversity. So if that approach is litigation, education, legislation, direct action, it all points towards okay. the same end. So I support people who do all of those things. And, uh, but also there's a, there's a, a need for a more aggressive, uh, approaches. For instance, you know, extinction rebellion is considered to be, uh, too aggressive, but I think they're right there. I mean, they, they're, 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 you know, they're expressing what needs to be expressed. And, uh, if people disagree with it, that's too bad, really. I mean, I, I don't really support a lot of the approaches, especially legislation and lit lit litigation, but I can see their effectiveness over time. And if that's where people are inclined to go, then by all means go that way. I, I support all those approaches. Uh, so the big topic of the day is, uh, when it comes to making humans, you know, pivot is climate change. It's, uh, it's to be, uh, difficult to entangle, but I have a couple of questions related to, to it as it's about to, uh, um, it's all about going against, you know, uh, and, and present it as a cause. So I wrote actually, interestingly, a couple of days ago, I wrote a, an article on LinkedIn mentioning Just Stop Oil, which is another, you know, organization, right. I think it's from the UK, uh, and arguing that it was too simplistic as a slogan, you know, as we cannot just stop oil, you know, and so fishing and killing the whales is a bit different as the reasons why it's still happening don't really make sense. And, and also it's illegal, but oil in climate change is too, truly a systemic, a systemic issue with ramifications everywhere. Do you have a point of view on how to deal with such a complex topic? I mean, there is no direct direction, you know, direct action that you can really take against such a big issue or, or is it you? Know, well, just off oil, they're speaking the truth. I mean, this is the root cause of, uh, of climate change. Even the oil companies knew that 30, 40 years ago, that this was, uh, was, uh, was a problem. Realistically, uh, can we get rid of oil or the use of fossil fuels? Not overnight. No, it's not going to happen. I mean, if we look at it, uh, even alternatives are still destructive. I mean, you got your electric car, but that electric car is going to get its yeah. electricity from burning off of oil or coal or whatever or sort of things, you know. In fact, our entire civilization is dependent upon fossil fuels. We couldn't even have fertilizer for the so-called green revolution. We, we, you know, uh, we, everything is dependent upon it, but we're squandering it and we're squandering it real fast. And I, within a hundred years, it's going to, it's going to be gone. What happens when oil is gone is that, um, what happens when oil is gone is that, uh, civilization is going to collapse. But you're saying, you, how do you address that? Because it, it looked like to me that it's a very difficult, I don't see where to start because you say, okay, we need to get rid of all for many reasons because going away and because of uh, climate change, but at the same time, we depend on it. So, you know, what's the fight there? <laughs> well, again, the root cause of this is, uh, and the anthropocentric attitude that we've adopted that, uh, yeah. it's all about us. Um. For example, just last week, I, you're familiar with Burning Man, right? Yeah. Well, I saw that, the, there I was saw a the demonstration, images, uh, demonstration by uh, Extinction Rebellion and a group of seven, I think it was. And they did a roadblock to stop people from going into Burning Man. And the reaction from the Burning Man participants was extreme anger. That's right. Yeah. And they called in the police and they, you know, they were actually cheering the police and say, rough them up. And some of them said, shoot the bastards and everything like this. To me, that was probably the ultimate demonstration of what Burning Man is all about. Because here they are, li listen to us, this climate change is real. No, we're not going to listen to you. We're going to go in there. And suddenly within two days, they're the victim of climate change. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so they were actually given a warning and that warning came true. 
And so I thought it was a very legitimate protest to focus the attention of those particular people because the people who attend Burning Man acknowledge that climate change is a problem. But it, it really illustrates the problem that we have everywhere. It always happens somewhere else. The fires in Lahaina, I don't live there. The, full, the hurricanes yeah. in Florida, I don't live there. The fires in Spain or Greece, I don't live there. So why should I even be concerned until suddenly it hits my community as a community in Burning Man sort of experience? So that's when people get involved, only when it hits their community. Yeah. It's only when, uh, you know, they're diagnosed with cancer that they, that they suddenly realize, hey, you know, maybe smoking's not that good, that kind of thing. And it's really uh, what I call adaptation to diminishment. And adaptation to diminishment served us well 30,000 30, 30, years ago when we had to adapt to changing situations. But now what it means is we just accept the diminishment and we move on. We remove a species, a fish species that was, uh, becomes commercially extinct. We, no longer, we don't even think about it anymore. Orange Ruffy was a commercial fish in the 1990s. You don't see it anymore because we fished it out. Uh, Northern cod fished out. Blue, uh, bluefin tuna fishing out. Uh, and then we adapt to, to species that nobody would have even thought of eating back in uh, 1960s, 1970s. Turbot or pollock or things like this. Pollock has no taste, but if you... If you put an imitation chemical flavor on it and put some red stripes on it, you can sell it as baked crab. So this is a constant, a constant adaptation to diminishment. And it's all based on the other thing, which I call the economics of extinction. There's money to be made by driving species extinct because as a, the fish populations are diminished, the price goes up. So scarcity uh, turns into demand, which in turns into higher profits. So a lot of fishing companies are actually making money out of driving species of fish to, to extinction. So the, and it's all based on the fact that humans are very self-centered, very greedy, very selfish as a species, not just as individuals, but as a species. And, um, this is having it, its impact. So here's a, here's a thing when it comes to fossil fuels, we either solve the problem or we die. <laughs> the government's approach to this is you either adapt to diminishment or we're going to put you in prison, <laughs> you know? Because we're not going to allow people to protest against uh, the destruction that we're causing. So it's a catch-22 already in places. For instance, Germany, they've been arresting people uh, before they leave the house, before they can go into uh, to demonstrations. And having lived through the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, I've seen a steady diminishment of not just the ecosystems that we live in, but also a steady diminishment of human rights and more an increase in more, uh, you know, stricter laws to stop people from actually not only protesting against these things, but even speaking out against it. Yeah. Well, it's also very much happening in France, you know, recently, I don't know if you follow, follow this up, but I guess you were informed. Uh, I would just to have a question related to psychology. I'm curious about your own tipping point. What, what made you change? How come you ended up doing this? Was this something special, uh, info, maybe some information, something that happened to you, you know? Well, I, I've never actually changed. I started doing what I was doing when I was 10 years old. I spent the, okay. I spent the summer uh, when I was 10 years old swimming with a family of beavers in Eastern Canada where I was raised. And the next summer when I went back, I couldn't find the beavers that I've been spending all that time with and found out that trappers had taken them out during the winter okay. and uh, killed them all and uh, it made me quite angry. So that winter, I began to walk trap lines and free animals and destroy the traps. And I've been pretty much doing the same thing ever since for the last 60 years. Okay, so that was it was the beaver. Sure. Your little, little yeah. tipping point but, and of your but emotional raised, shock. But I was raised in a fishing village on the east coast of Canada, very, very intimately close to marine creatures. Uh, you know, yeah, I ran yeah. off to I ran off to sea when I was young, joined the Norwegian Free and Canadian Coast Guard. So I had the nautical experience and I put that to work doing marine conservation work. Are there tipping points in a fight? And and are they clear, you know, when you start the fight, you know, because I, I guess, you know, when you start the Japanese government with just a few boats, do you foresee that you can win if you reach a certain objective or if you, uh, you know, attack so many boats, how having that idea of tipping points can be strategic to entering into an action? Well, I think the thing is, is, uh, is persistence. Uh, you just have to keep doing it no matter what it can take. It took us. 30 years to end uh, the commercial seal hunting in Canada. It's going to take us 40 years to stop the killing of pilot whales in the Faroe Islands. 
So you have to be prepared to, to outlast the opposition in that respect. None of, none of these things are, are, are won overnight. So, uh, that, that I think is the secret to it. Just stubbornly be persistent and, uh, just keep at, keep at it. Okay. Even if you don't know, you know, how long that will, that will last in there. Yeah. Well, it could last a lifetime. It could last into the next generation. Uh, you have to inspire. Yeah, you could lose, yeah. You know. And, uh, well, actually, uh, I would like to stay on the psychology aspect of things. I, I read that a question that you asked in interviews for Sea Shepherd is, uh, are you ready to die serving a whale? Mm. Did you reflect on why yourself are ready to die for your cause and maybe, you know, how it sets you apart from most people? Well, in an anthropocentric culture, it's perfectly normal to ask young people to risk their life and to die for flags and oil wells, real estates, and uh, religion. I think it's a far more noble thing to risk your life to protect an endangered species or a threatened uh, or endangered habitat. So I don't see anything wrong with that at all. Um, you know, and the, the, I have so many of my crew who are quite willing to do that. In fact, I won't even accept anybody on my crew unless they're willing to say, yes, I'm willing to do that. Because I need that kind of devotion, uh, that kind of commitment in order to, to make a difference, to not back down on, 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 under pressure or threat. Uh, we just had two women uh, occupy uh, two Icelandic whaling ships in the last couple of days. And uh, they kept them from going for two days and they confiscated all their water, which forced them to come down. But again, that's a commitment. They were up there for 48 hours, uh, one of them without any water. And, uh, they, 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 they achieved their goal of, uh, you know, of, of shutting the, those whaling boats down for at least 48 hours. And this is the kind of commitment that we look for in our, in our cruise. It's all about money because when, when I listen to you, because when you say they, I think about what are, what are the interests of people are doing this? Is it just about money or are there other things in the, well, the people killing the whales? Yeah, I mean, people destroying the, the ocean and people uh, overfishing and destroying the wells. And uh, it all comes down to making profit, selling more things, or are there other things in, in that come Harshly. into play? Harshly. In the, Chris, the case of Christian Lofsen in Iceland, he's the wealthiest man in Iceland. He's sort of a modern-day Captain Ahab. He loves killing whales. He's obsessed with killing whales. And uh, that, to him, is a, that's his personal motivation. He doesn't need to do it. It's he a hobby. It. He loses two to three million dollars every year trying to do this, but this is what he wants to do because uh, he hates environmentalists and he hates whales. <laughs> I mean, it's as simple as that. Okay. I don't know why he hates whales, but he certainly does. And when it comes down to it, you know, I was uh, interviewing a fisherman in Alaska one time, and I said, "Look, for no other reason, uh, protect the fish so that your children will be part have a have a fishery to be involved in." And his answer to me was astounding. He said. You know, in five years, my mortgage is paid. And after that, I couldn't give a damn. So why does somebody like that have children? Well, it's because it's what you do. We don't give much thought to it. It's just what you do. So we don't really give much thought to the future of our own children in many ways. And uh, because it's sort of what you do. Again, it's that anthropocentric mindset. This is what we do. We, we created our own God to worship. We created, and that God has made us a neat, unique and special and everything else. And we're better than everything else. And that's our, our attitude on that. So it's, it's a, it's a, a, a human, human arrogance, really. I call it homo arrogantus. It's what we've become. And, uh, so I think that's really the motivation behind it. We're going to do anything we want. And nobody's going to tell us we can't do it. And how do we change that? Can you change? Well, the only way to change it is to change the, uh, the, the, the philosophical mindset from anthropocentrism to biocentrism. The examples are there from indigenous cultures all around the world that actually live a biocentric lifestyle and understand the true values of biocentrism. But anthropocentrism is very, it's a very difficult, to me, it's a collective of mass psychosis and that. I got a call from a Fox News reporter named Brett Hume and he said, did you say in a talk that, burr, uh, that uh, worms and bees and trees and whales are more important than people? And I said, yes, I said that. He said, how could you say something so outrageous? And I said, because they're more important than people. And I can tell you why, because they can live here without us, but we cannot live here without them. We don't live in a world without trees. We don't live in a world without bees. And we don't live in a world without fish or whales. It's as simple as that. They don't need us, but we need them. And ecologically, that makes us much more, um, 
Yeah, th that makes it much more important than we are. You've been doing this for over 40 years now? No, 60 years. Yeah, 60 years since you, you told the story of it when you were 10. With the experience that you have, would you, would you have done something differently? And can it be an insight for you today or not? Would I, have, uh, I certainly wouldn't have been doing anything else, but I probably, if I had anything to, I could do over again, I would probably take a more aggressive stand in some situations that I've been in, because it's hard to measure just how far you can go, uh, in terms of staying within the boundaries of practicality and the law. And in hindsight, you realize you could have got a lot further, but, uh, I think that I don't really have any regrets for what I've done. Uh, not only the individual campaigns, which have saved the lives of literally thousands and thousands of sentient creatures, but also because it's been uh, an inspiration to so many uh, people around the world to understand that as an individual, they can make a difference, that they can change the world. And that has been the most important lesson, I think, that uh, all the actions that we've taken over the years has instilled uh, in people is this confidence uh, to understand that they can make a difference. I want to go back to the diagnostic a little bit because we didn't spend much time on this, but what is the state of the ocean right now? And us, you know, did you see improvements regarding fisheries, whale and other mammal protections? And uh, of, what are the other issues that we're facing? Because the state ocean of the is a ocean. system. Yeah. The state of the ocean is the ocean is dying. And uh, not only overfishing, but we're using advanced technologies to even be more effective in extracting fish from the ocean. When you take a, when you spend a hundred million to $200 million on one ship, a super trawler, that's going to take a lot of fish to pay the bank loans off. So it's a vicious circle. Invest heavily in the technology, satellites, fish finders, big ships, hundred mile long drift nets, giant per se nets, uh, gill nets, invest in this, but you need money to invest it. And therefore you have to borrow heavily to get that money, to get that technology, which means you have to catch even more fish in order to pay off those, uh, those debts. So you have super trawlers out there that are taking more fish in one haul than entire fishing operations in many countries. In just one day, they can take more than say many countries in the world. And they're, and they're doing this, um, despite the fact that governments know that the fish populations are declining and because they're, you know, I, I recently was in Ireland, the Irish fishing fleets, they're allowed to go out one month a year. That's it. Meanwhile, the super trawlers operating 20 miles off their coast, taking everything they want. And, uh, because the EU has decided that they can do that. Uh, yeah. the world is full of fishing operations, legal and illegal. And I say about 40% of them are illegal. And, uh, so we don't, can't even trace the fish in the markets, in the restaurants. Where did it come from? There's no way to trace it because it's, it's transshipped at sea, for example. A good percentage of the fish that's sold in restaurants and markets was caught illegally. And also, it certainly was caught unsustainably. There's no such thing as a sustainable fishery anymore. For instance, toothfish was a good example, marketed as Chilean sea bass. You know, you catch this fish in the Southern Ocean, you freeze it, you bring it back to a port, you put it on airplanes, you send it to New York, you send it to Paris so that they can sell it for, you know, in fancy restaurants. That's not a sustainable fishery. The carbon footprint is enormous. You know, and the fishing industry will say, uh, oh, yeah, there's a billion people whose livelihoods depend upon fishing. Yes, that's true, but not owns, not industrialized fishing. We're talking about the guy who goes out in the canoe off the coast of the, uh, Nigeria or the Philippines. Yes, that is a subsistence fishing, but that's not what this is all about. What we're opposed to is highly industrialized, mechanized fishing operations like the, the big giant gill netters, drift netters, purse saners, and the factory ships, the big super trawlers. That's where, where the diminishment is coming from. Well, some people th say that if we stop overfishing, the ocean could cure, and, mm. you know, despite climate change, meaning that, that climate change is really not about CO2 emissions only. And, uh, is this something that, that you've looked at? It is actually a solution to climate change at the 2015 Paris, uh, climate conference. That was what I was saying. If you want to address climate change, all you have to do is nothing. And by that me, I mean, leave the ocean alone, let it rejuvenate it, let it cure and repair itself from the damage that we've done. And that will go a long ways towards addressing climate change. Uh, we only have to look at the world in World War I and World War II, when the time that the fishing fleets were unable to operate, 
And in that very short time, the populations began to regenerate quickly. Uh, that, so what I was proposing in 2015 was a moratorium on industrialized, heavy mechanized gear fishing uh, for, for 75 years to allow the oceans to completely repair themselves from the damage that we've done. And it can happen. It could, that could be. The value of a fish in the ocean, swimming around in the ocean, is far greater than it, the value of a fish on anybody's plate because this is a system which is actually uh, regulating climate change, regulating um, the distribution of nutrients uh, throughout the ocean. All of these species in the oceans are working in harmony, and the only disruption is human interventions, which are causing this, this problem. Over the last couple of hundred years, we have lost so many species, and we've even forgotten they were even there. There used to be walrus in the coast of Maine. There used to be belugas, uh, whales in Long Island Sound. The sea mink is extinct. The Atlantic gray whale is extinct. The Newfoundland wolf is extinct. The giant hawk is extinct. And I could go down for a next, you know, a couple hundred species that have gone extinct. And the sad part, not only have they gone extinct, we've forgotten they were there. We just adapted to that diminishment. They're gone and let's move on to something else. So the world has been much diminished, but we don't realize it because we simply accepted that diminishment. The shifting baseline, right? Um, we don't realize what's disappearing because, uh, because it's too slow in, you know, compared to human lifetime. Who is preventing this, this type of decision to be taken? Um, is it the big corporations? Is it mafia in some way? You know, is it the consumer's fault? Well, the responsibility goes right across the board, but I think mainly because governments are owned and controlled by corporations and media is owned and controlled by corporations. That, uh, you know, politics is the art of the possible. That means that no politician is going to do anything that's going to lose him votes. 1980, I believe it was Prime Minister Joe Clark in Canada who said that uh, we should be looking at the real price of a gallon of, of gas. And what he meant by the real price is that, you know, we're subsidizing this. The government is subsidizing it. He said, said let's cut the subsidies. Whoa, six months later, he was no longer Prime Minister. <laughs> You come up with a solution, you come up with a solution that's going to work and uh, the corporate, uh, the corporations are saying, no, 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 that's going to happen. I mean, we pass a, we pass a bill in California to ban plastic bags, single use plastic bags. The petroleum companies, the plastic bag companies are on it right in the moment, spending, uh, you know, tens of millions of dollars to lobby, to reverse it, that kind of thing. So it's been really, really difficult to try and, uh, to get anything done through, through government. Usually with governments, it's a case of solving the problem too little, too late. What gives you hope and, you know, what scares you the most in, uh, for the next 10 years? Well, I don't actually have hope, uh, because it's never been something that's important to me. I learned a very good lesson in 1973. I was a volunteer medic for the American Indian movement during the occupation of Wounded Knee. We were surrounded and being shot at, uh, 46 people were wounded, two were killed. And I went to Russell Means, the leader of the American Indian Movement, and I said, look, we don't have any hope of winning here. The odds are against us, and uh, we're not going to win. So, sorry, no, my, my son has woken up. Uh, but we're not going to win here, so what are we doing here? And he looked at me and he said, we're not here because we're concerned about winning or losing. We're not concerned, we're not concerned about the odds against us. We're here because this is the right place to be, the right thing to do, and the right time to do it. Don't worry about the future. All your power lies in the present. That's where you can do anything. And the, and the present defines the future. So I just concentrate on what I can do now, today, in the present. And uh, hopefully, hopefully that will define what the future will be. Um, what I'm missing, what are we missing here? Like, what, what do you want to talk about that, uh, haven't, that is important to you and, uh, you know, that's not going through enough? I think that in addition to looking uh, at the world from a biocentric point of view, is it's also good to understand uh, just what this planet is. And I just recently wrote a children's book about it called We Are the Ocean. You know, we call this the planet Earth, but it's really the planet ocean. And what that means is that it's water. It's water in continuous circulation. Sometimes it's in the sea and sometimes in ice, sometimes underground, and sometimes in the atmosphere, and sometimes it's in the cells of every plant and animal on the planet. Water continuously moving through those mediums. The water in your body right now is once in probably in a bird or in an insect or in a plant or once underground or in ice. That water, it's that continuous movement of water. 
that is the ocean. We are the ocean. So we're all, everything is connected by that one uh, element of water. Everything is connected there. And uh, therefore, I think it, it really, we should have a responsibility to understand that what we do in the atmosphere ex, ex, uh, impacts what's in the sea. What we do in the sea impacts what's on land and impacts what's in our bodies and everything. It's all connected. And we need to look at it as a unified sort of, uh, in a unified sort of way that this is a whole that we're part of and not independent of. Um, do you have a message that could be useful or practical for those listening to us? In what um, a particular in, message? In what I'm trying to do more and more now is to, it's a lot of concepts, it's a lot of ideas, but I, I, I feel that all people that are listening to it feel like, okay, well, but what can I do? I think that what people can do is simply to find out what you're passionate about and then uh, use your abilities, your skills to act on that passion. And through the virtues of courage and imagination and passion, we can change the world. We've seen it so many times. We can make the impossible become possible. In 1972, the very idea that Nelson Mandela would become president of South Africa was unthinkable and impossible. And yet the impossible became possible. So that's what I always strive for, is to look for the impossible solutions to impossible problems. Last question. Do you have two books or two pieces of art or experiences that one should spend time with or, or do? you know, in their, in their life, according to you. Two books or what do you mean? I mean, usually it's two books to read, um, but I guess, in you know, to experience, to experiences to live, you know, if you have a, that, that you should live in your life. Like, oh, expanding expanding the question. Own books you make. Yeah. Uh, I think one of the most powerful books I ever read was, uh, Sea of Slaughter by Farley Mowat, uh, which documents 500 years of what we've done on the, in the Northern Atlantic ocean and that, but, um, Again, there's a, well, there's a lot of people who write on a lot of subjects and everything like that. But, uh, you know, I've written books on climate change. I've written books on history. I've written children's books. And, uh, but, and of course, I've drawn along uh, on a lot of experiences from a lot of people in, in doing that. But uh, so overall, I just, I think the best thing to do is to look at the world in a different way, which is uh, the biocentric point of view. Well, thanks so much for your time and for your, your, your insights, Captain okay. Watson. Thank and you. Thank, thank you for putting up with the noise. I got a dog, I got a baby, I got all kinds of things here. It's okay. You, you're not at home, right? So I am at home. <laughs> you are at home in Paris? Yes. Ah, okay. You have, you have your place. I thought you were in a, in a traveling in a hotel or something. Yeah. Anyway, it's, it's good. I think people will appreciate it and uh, have a good time there. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, thank you so much.